I am Renee Hutchins. <coughs> I am the moderator of this post-lunch panel. I teach the Appellate and Post-Conviction Advocacy Clinic here at the law school. And we got to spend this morning thinking and talking about community needs and about expanding the mission of clinics. And then we heard at lunch about Maureen Sweeney's case in the clinic and the Martinez case in the Fourth Circuit and the ways in which she was largely able to avoid some of the external pressures that might be exerted. Um, and so that was almost a perfect segue into this clinic, I mean into this panel, because for this panel we are going to be looking at present and future issues that affect uniquely clinical law programs at state-run schools. Um, so to have that conversation, we are not going to do presentations, we're going to do a series of questions. I'm going to sit down as soon as I finish introducing our panel, but to have that conversation, we've got three really terrific panelists. Um, our first panelist is Jane Barrett. She is the director of the environmental law program here at the uh, Maryland Carey School of Law. Before joining our faculty, which she did in 2007, she had practiced for more than 35 years, even though she looks like a veritable babe in the woods. Um, she began her career with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. She then went to be an assistant United States attorney in the District of Maryland, where she was the chief of the environmental litigation section. Um, in 2010, she received the Clinical Legal Education Association's Outstanding Advocate Award, and in 2012, she got the ABA's award for the, or the Environmental Law Clinic, got the ABA's award for Distinguished Achievement in Environmental Law and Policy. Um, our next panelist to my immediate left is John Dubin. He is the Alfred C. Clapp Public Service Professor of Law and the Associate Dean. <laughs> of clinical education at Rutgers Newark. Um, prior to joining the faculty at Rutgers Newark, he was a professor and the director of clinical law programs at St. Mary's Law School. Before that, he worked at LDF, where Cheryl Lynn is now the executive director who spoke with us last night, and he was at the ACLU. He has also served as the legal director for the clinical division of Harlem Legal Aid. Professor Dubin has served on a number of national committees, including ALS and um, CLE committees, sorry, CLIA committees, and he is also an accomplished scholar. In 2002, he received the Edgar and Jean Kahn Award. I thought that this was a very interesting one. The Edgar and Jean Kahn Award from the National Equal Justice Library for authoring one of the 20th century's most outstanding articles about equal justice for lower income people. Rounding out today's panel is our very own Michael Pernard, who is the director of the clinical law program here. He, is, um, he teaches the reentry clinic and the reentry legal theory and practice seminar. He has been active nationally in efforts to improve legal education, and he is also the co-editor-in-chief of the Clinical Law Review and the former president of CLIA. So we are going to begin with you, John. <laughs> so my first question to you is, um, you wrote recently in an article, copies of which are up front because I asked him to bring them, so I am promoting, he is not self-promoting, this is not shameless self-promotion. Um, you wrote in an article that you published in Rutgers Law Review in 2003 the following. Although public universities are properly construed as the state for many legal purposes, they are not the state for all purposes. The distinction is an important one because there are situations where the attribution of state status to clinical functions would interfere with and hinder the clinic's representation of clients or accomplishments of core uh, educational goals. So you just confronted these issues in a case that you handled up at Rutgers. Could you tell us a little bit about that case and about some of the issues that it involved? Yeah, it's, it's tough when you've been taking on the state to all of a sudden you deemed the state the man. It's like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm not me. I'm not, <laughs> not the state. Um, and actually, we were more of a client in this case than we were uh, a party. We ended up being amicus, but I'll tell you how it came about. But first, I want to thank you for the invitation here. To me, it's, a, it's an honor to be at Maryland's uh, celebration again. Uh, you've been a dynamic and uh, vital program and a leader in clinical education for a long time, something that many of us from other schools look to to get a sense of what we should be doing and I think that's particularly true with respect to state law schools and public law schools and um, 
finding a way to navigate through the particular obstacles that state uh, universities confront. And that's my segue to this question about the, uh, our recent case, which arose from a work in our environmental clinic, but spread to our constitutional clinic. And our work was, uh, a lot of our work was done uh, by our constitutional uh, clinic in defense of our environmental clinic. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things that happened, I think uh, probably, I didn't hear all the presentations before I got here, and, and Jane can probably speak to this, but when you take on powerful interests, as schools like Maryland have done for some time, you often get opposition that not only opposes you on the merits, but tries to take out a, opposing counsel. Uh, Bob Kuhn has written powerfully about this for some time. The interference with uh, clinical education programs is sort of a tactic to undermine opposition. And there are some additional tools with which opposing counsel can do that when the clinic, when the opposition is a clinical program that is public or state subsidized. One of those tools is the state open records laws, or freedom of information laws, and we had that used against us in this environmental case. It was a, a controversy arose from an effort to block development of a large strip mall in uh, Franklin uh, Township, New Jersey, and the developer alleged that uh, the clinic's client, which was a nonprofit uh, organization seeking environmentally compatible development in that same part of New Jersey, was in cahoots with a competing business concern, and that was what was motivating their opposition to the big proposed strip mall. So they brought a tortious interference uh, with business claim against the competing business. They tried to join our client in this tort action, and then they tried to get discovery, civil discovery of communications between the nonprofit and the business, and what we had in our files that reflected communication or anything about the controversy. Well, the judge in this tort action refused to allow the discovery, said it was either attorney client or work product or overbroad under the civil discovery rules, and eventually he dismissed the lawsuit against a nonprofit, saying it was a veiled attempt to chill the First Amendment rights of citizens who were opposed to the development. It was a slap suit, in essence. But the big developer, undaunted, then went on to say, we're going to try to still get this information, but through the university using the Open Records Act uh, law. And hey, Rutgers, you're a, a public university, so all your records are public records. And they sought uh, 18 different categories of information from our environmental clinic staff and students, including minutes of clinical staff meetings, documents received by any members of the nonprofit organizations, uh, or from this other business's council, or from the township, or from the land use board. You get the idea. Um, so our custodian of records uh, declined to disclose the information, and uh, the uh, business then brought this, the developer brought this lawsuit under Oprah to try to compel us to disclose. Now, one of the first things we did, of course, apart from contacting Bob Kuhn and realizing the magnitude of this, and we were very lucky that Bob and Clea got involved on our behalf in this as well, is uh, trying to figure out the nature of this. We believe that a determination that a state clinical program's private case files could be open records would seriously and uniquely disadvantage our program and our clients and potentially damage other state law clinical programs. Unlike every other law firm in the state and uh, clinics at private law schools, Oprah could force us to tell our clients that private materials that you submit to us are potentially disclosable to your adversaries in this lawsuit, not only to adversaries, to any interested person in the public who wants to get it. Millions of potential strangers to the lawsuit. You know how you usually have those conversations with clients where you say, you know, anything you tell us or give us is confidential? We'd have to sort of, well, except for anything that could be requested by millions of people who want to try to get access to it under open records law. So this means that anyone who wants to harass the clinics or their clients, not only developers or polluters in environmental cases, but, I mean, think of the possibilities. Uh, uh, abusers and spousal abuse cases, uh, for example, uh, anyone to harass the client, harass the clinic, divert us from the task of teaching students and representing uh, clients. Um, 
And by the way, uh, one aspect of this involved, uh, you know, first sort of getting a handle of this internally ourselves, but also educating university council because when you make an open records request, it goes to the university. The university defends it. We're not defending it. We're again, we're the client. The university says, turn over this information or, you know, when we, so we can figure out what we give and what we don't give, you know, what fits into an exemption and what doesn't, which is how they generally handle open records requests. And we said, well, wait a minute. We think what we need here is a categorical exemption. We don't think the open records law was ever intended to apply to private client files. And uh, we got a little resistance on that from our university. We eventually got them to agree to let us do an amicus brief. We already had Bob willing to do an amicus brief. We did an amicus brief on our behalf as well, starting at the trial court, went to the Court of Appeals all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing for the need for a categorical exemption and the problems and burdens that we would have to confront if we would have to do a case-by-case -case evaluation of every OPA request in every case file and every document and try to fit every piece into a particular exemption, knowing also that, you know, attorney-client has a bunch of holes in it. It's not the broadest exemption. The exceptions to attorney-client, which is one of the statutory exemptions to OPA, are liberally construed by the courts. The court hadn't even held uh, definitively that work product is exempt from OPA. Um, and just a lot of items, things you can't get in contextual discovery balancing, like because a request is overbroad. There's no overbreath or relevance exemption to an Oprah request. So we had great concerns, and uh, we pursued um, that position. We were ultimately successful. I should say that one member of the New Jersey Supreme Court, when it got up to that level, took the position that our university council uh, initially took, which was that what are you worried about? Anything important will fit into an exemption like uh, attorney-client or pedagogical materials or otherwise. So you should just deal with Oprah like anyone else does. Fortunately, a majority of the court recognized the unique burdens that we would confront vis-a-vis -vis every other private attorney in the state, every other private law school, and that they didn't intend to burden us in some unique way that every other law office uh, would be burdened. So I, before I bring uh, Michael and Jane into the conversation, I just wanted to follow up on one thing that you said. So you talked about the need to educate university council, and you talked about um, the custodian of records refusing to turn. How, how early in the conversation did they bring you in? So did they bring you in as a logistical matter because they didn't have the documents, there's no central repository that they could just pull them out of? Or did they bring you in early because they recognized this is a, a unique issue facing this state-run clinical program. Now, I think we had to flag the issue, okay. frankly. I mean, the first thing they do is they contact whoever it is that's involved in this and say, mm -hmm. turn over the information so we can make this assessment. Mm -hmm. So our response was reactive. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This whole process of sort of turning things over and doing this case-by-case -case sifting is something that's troubling to us, and here's why. And that's a it had to be sort of a dialectic on that to eventually convince the university council that they should push our position, the categorical exemption position, that there's something different about private client case files in a public, publicly supported clinic that's different from, you know, asking for information on how the, the chemistry department gets its funding from the Department of Defense or whatever, um, which I guess would get turned over under Oprah. Right. So, uh, Michael, if I could bring you in now to the conversation. So we've heard about from John a particular challenge that he faced in terms of being treated as the state uh, in a clinical law program. But what are some of the benefits of state clinical law programs? Well, I think um, particularly Maryland, we don't <coughs> have any private law schools in Maryland. And so as public law schools, I think that we have um, – unique relationships with the stakeholders throughout the state. We have unique relationships with our legislature, with our judiciary, with our state bar associations, with our local bar associations, and um, with communities that surround our, our law schools and with the legal services communities as well. So I think the benefits, well, among the benefits are our built-in relationships with, well, they've been earned, but there's an, there's an expectation to a certain degree that we are partners in some ways with sort of the external world within our particular jurisdictions. 
And obviously with that comes a lot of responsibility, but I do think those are some benefits. As a result of all of those relationships, um, I do think that our programs, much like private law schools as well, that clinical legal education, we've heard a lot between last night and today about all the variety of skills that our students need to be prepared to engage the legal profession upon graduation, but also just from a service provision perspective, that we need to have robust clinical law programs. So we need to have a variety of, of clinics and um, a variety of sort of pedagogies that are employed. So, you know, sort of the big cases that Paul Reingold has talked about in his scholarship and the pedagogical benefits of big cases, small cases, all different types of lawyering, alternative dispute resolution, community education, et cetera. So I do think we have that responsibility to our students to teach the variety of skills in a variety of practice settings. But I also think we have an obligation to our state, if you will, our jurisdictions, to meet the clients who have these particular issues. Do you think that that's something that is unique to state-run programs, or do you think that that is something that is shared across clinical legal education? Um, I think it's, I think it's, obviously there might be some disagreement, but I think it's shared across clinical legal education. But I do think, again, in a place like Maryland, mm -hmm. that they look to us to do that type of work. Again, because we're in a state where there are no private law schools, and given our relationships, so we very much are a point of contact for the stakeholders right. to address these issues. Right. Okay, so Jane, I'm going to bring you in now. <laughs> so Michael has talked to us about the variety of clinical programs that need to be offered, the unique perspective of, of Maryland law schools, there being only two, both state-run law schools here in the state, um, the need to offer, you know, big cases, small cases, individual representations, institutional representation, all that kind of thing. Can you talk to us, you know, in, in the environmental law program, you have the opportunity to do both sort of smaller individual cases and much larger cases. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, some of the constraints, <laughs> I'll put it that way, um, on, on undertaking big cases that you think are specific to this particular context? Okay. Um, and I, I want to define big case not only to mean complex civil litigation, but also to mean uh, commentary and input for clients into um, administrative regulatory proceedings where you have highly invested adversaries opposing the limitations that the regulations may put on them. And the reason I do that is because I think the vulnerability of a state institution is that big cases, as I've just defined them, necessarily mean that you are competing against very powerful adversaries. And those very powerful adversaries have things we don't have or have not, don't have at necessarily the levels they do. One, they have a lot of money that they can spend on media campaigns and blitzes, on whining and dining legislators, on hiring the biggest and best advocates in terms of lawyers, as well as resources to pay for experts. Um, it was interesting because when Renee posed this question, I did four dollar signs. And I think all of my, my responses as a state institution relate to the dollar signs <coughs> because um, as Secretary Perez said last night, you know, we are in a different world than we were when I started litigating 35 years ago, or actually almost 40 years ago now. Um, back then, it absolutely tr was true as an assistant U.S. attorney, and even in private practice, you did not talk about your case except through the pleadings, because if you did, you were, you know, a sleazy lawyer. That ain't happening anymore. And one of the things that happens with media messaging is that corporate America, and, I, and I'm going to move myself from my role as clinic director and go back to the 10 years I spent in private practice representing Fortune 500 companies. Every case I had, I was hired to do the defense, and a public relations firm was hired at the same time to manage the public image. And not infrequently, the money that was spent on public relations outstripped the legal fees. And when you realize the economic disparity 
and how the internet um, makes things go viral. What happens is if you aren't prepared for it, it's, it's what happened to us, is your case can then become uh, framed in a way that has little to no relationship to the actual facts that are going to be presented at trial. But it doesn't matter because by that time, the public, your legislators, they have a mindset that you don't either have the energy, time, or money to try to change their minds. So I think that's a real big impediment. And it's not only, as I said, an impediment to litigation, it's an impediment. So where are you? Does that mean a state institution shouldn't take on these big issues? No, I don't think it does mean that. I think it means that we need to learn from past experience and prepare ourselves better. Um, I think another big constraint that kind of falls from that is the legislative impact and the need to be alert at all times that even things that you don't think are going to ruffle anybody's feathers, if there's a vested interest involved, they're going to angle it so that it comes back as an attack. Some of you may not know, you know, you all know the, the heat we got for the Purdue case. Um, I started here in 2007. By the summer of 2008, Chancellor Kerwin got his first complaint about the work we were doing on administrative appeals on regulations. And there was a complaint filed either by the housing industry, um, the utility industry. I mean, there's been complaints every year um, because we are adverse to those who represent economic interests in this state. And it's just the fact of the world for an environmental law clinic. Um, just, mm -hmm. That's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, you know, and then staffing is the other issue. With a state institution, you are always scrambling for how you can staff it. And I look very jealously at some privately, you know, Tulane University or uh, Pace where they actually have a lot, you know, they have staff attorneys and they have litigators, not the clinic director who's expected to litigate, right. but they are able to have a more, more depth in their litigation support, which enables the, the director to do more of the teaching function rather than the litigation. And for state university, when it's one person, you're basically getting split in different ways. Right. So, so if, if you could just, I'm going to ask you if you could think a little bit about one of the constraints that you mentioned, and that's media campaigns. And I just, I wanted to get your thoughts on whether, on, on two things, whether the um, democratization of media messaging through avenues like YouTube. And so at lunch, somebody, mm -hmm. I can't remember who raised the question about, well, could you put up a YouTube video? Um, um, uh, it sort of tells your client's story. Um, is that maybe a way to level the playing field when you're dealing with a very well-funded adversary? And the other question I wanted to ask to follow up on that is, do you think that our students are in a different place in terms of a comfort level with more democratic media than perhaps we as professors are? Um, I think that the answer to both is yes, with a caveat. You cannot, and I think the discussion at lunch kind of informed that, is, you know, one person says, oh, you know, I just smoked a, you know, a joint mm -hmm. and I'm in jail. Well, oop, you don't want to say that, um, or, I'm, or I'm an informant, I guess. That was, <laughs> you don't want to say that. That might be a compelling reason. So. I think the role of the lawyer, and interestingly, this was a role I played in private practice, was nothing, if I was lead counsel on a case and there was a media team working on the media strategy, nothing went up unless I saw it. Mm -hmm. And so what you have to do, and it's actually, I think, a very important skill set for that students can gain from, is learning how you allow clients to have their message but also frame it so that it doesn't come back to bite you in litigation. Right, right. So yes, I think you can do it. And I do think students are more open to it. In fact, I think the problem in our society as a whole is everybody's so used to having everything hang, hang out there that it's the restraint part of it that's kind of hard, particularly for our nonprofit clients who are used to saying anything they want to say out in the public media. Right. Um, so John, I'm going to get you back in on the conversation. So we've been talking a little bit about constraints and we've heard about legislative impacts, we've heard about staffing, we've heard about public records, about um, challenges when you're facing 
well-funded opposition. Um, are there other obstacles to clinical operations that are, are particularly unique to the kind of program here at Maryland, at Rutgers, state-run clinical law programs? Yeah, actually, when we were doing the research for the opposition on the open records uh, case, uh, we discovered, well, actually, we had been, been confronting uh, obstacles to our work based on our state affiliation for some time, I think that sort of brought together sort of a, maybe there's a collective theme here in looking at these challenges that we've had from the 1970s to the present that we've confronted, that other state schools have confronted over time, including right here at Maryland. I think initially uh, we saw challenges to state law clinics' efforts to recover attorney's fees in taking on the state that the state would often argue that, hey, you can't recover attorney's fees from the state. You are the state. And some states have constitutional provisions, as we had in New Jersey, that said you can't get a, an appropriation from one part of the state to another part of the state without there being a legislative authorization. And that's what you're doing when you prevail against the state in a civil rights lawsuit and then try to get court awarded attorney's fees. Well, we were able to prevail on that. Um, and I should point out, I think one of the early cases was right here at Maryland, handled by Mike Milliman, that we cited uh, NAACP Frederick uh, County versus Thompson, I think, where yeah. same argument made against you, and you prevailed. And the 1987 case, yeah. one of the 40 years that he's uh, been doing this. Here. There you go. <laughs> um, another area is uh, challenges to uh, uh, clinic litigation before state agencies or against the state based on state conflict of interest rules. Uh, another is challenges to representation of nonprofits based on state constitutional provisions that many states have that prevent the donation of uh, state resources to private groups or private parties. And then, of course, our most recent challenge, the use of open records laws and uh, um, the common law right to know. Um, all of these different areas, I think what's common is they all require courts to one degree or another to offer a legal interpretation or a legal construction of a state law clinic as a state actor and to interpret the legal significance of that state affiliation, something that we as public and state law schools have to confront that private schools don't. The courts have to address what's the construction of a state or public law school in the face of legal provisions that are generally applicable to more typical state entities and should they apply here. Our position and my position in this article um, has been that while a state school is in fact state supported and state affiliated, um, that support and affiliation doesn't render uh, the institution the state for all purposes, that you need to have a more flexible and uh, functional contextual assessment before determining whether these generally applicable uh, constitutional or statutory provisions should be deemed to limit or restrict what a state clinic does in the same way as more typical state entities based on state status. And that resulted in we developed sort of a three-step approach, which we've gotten, fortunately, the Supreme Court of New Jersey to accept, but I will suggest it for export. Um, first, it involves recognition that the statutory or constitutional plain language uh, cannot control the assessment, that you have to look at the underlying purposes of the statutory or constitutional uh, provisions in question and examine them to determine whether their application in that particular context uh, is served uh, as applied to clinics. So, for example, if the purpose of uh, the state conflict of interest uh, law is to prevent undue influence and corruption by state legislators who are moonlighting by taking on cases before state agencies that they're also regulating. Well, that's sound reason for having a conflict of interest rule, but it doesn't really apply when state clinics are representing under, uh, underrepresented uh, individuals before state agencies. Makes no sense. Uh, similarly, if the purpose of the anti-donation of state resources provision is to prevent the giveaway of state money or state land to private corporations, well, that purpose isn't served through preventing a clinic uh, from representing a nonprofit. Uh, or if the purpose of the open records law is to promote transparency in government, that purpose isn't served by requiring uh, disclosure of private client case file information. 
The second step is examination of the purposes of the state's establishment of its university and determine whether the proposed application is consistent with those purposes. For example, in our conflict of interest case, the court found that the purpose of the state's assumption of responsibilities in funding of a, a law school through Rutgers has always included an overriding concern for academic freedom. And it found that this freedom would be undermined if clinical faculty's choice of pedagogy is restricted by preventing clinical faculty members from teaching and supervising cases before state agencies. That we had argued that our choice of cases and clients and the nature of the work we do is like our choice of books and materials in the classroom, all in the exercise of academic freedom. And finally, third, uh, the court should be uh, aided by a guiding interpretive principle that when the state gets involved in higher education, it doesn't do so to disadvantage that higher education, to make it worse qualitatively or otherwise. In fact, just the opposite. So all these practices that we have challenged involve limitations that would hinder the quality of clinical education involved at public institutions. For one thing, they'd limit clinical education in a way that no private law school would be restricted or limited, and the state shouldn't be assumed to have intentionally created lower quality clinical education opportunities at its state school. So those are the, that's been sort of our paradigm and it's carried the day for us in this series of controversies. Could, could you talk just a little bit about the second? So you said that the second was about getting them to understand that academic freedom um, was a, 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 a core value that needed to be advanced. But sometimes when people outside of the academy hear the term academic freedom, they hear- They go crazy. Exactly. It's a bunch of privileged academics worried about you know, their ability to navel gaze, with regard to issues that aren't critical, how did you make that message resonate outside of the walls of the academy? Well, we were fortunate that there's a fair amount of legislative history about the sort of takeover of Rutgers, which did mm -hmm. start out as part of the state about wanting to preserve its academic freedom and support it and how that was consistent with the state's vision of higher education that we could draw on to uh, support that argument. But I think the larger argument is that the state's purposes in supporting higher education, supporting a public law school, would, be, would not be served, would not be furthered by the particular application of a generally applicable state provision to the clinic in, in this situation. Mm -hmm. And academic freedom is what we went to because we have this body that we could draw upon, this body of uh, legislative history. Gotcha. Um, so, Michael, I want to bring you back in now. So, so in talking about the three-part test and in talking about the ways in which uh, John was able to successfully convince the New Jersey Supreme Court that at times state institutions should be treated as the state and at other times they shouldn't, he's highlighted sort of the rub for state schools. Sometimes we are state actors and sometimes we are, function more as independent legal services. <coughs> Um, so if you could talk a li just a little bit about how state clinical law programs can, can walk that line, can, can um, address the multiple needs of their various stakeholders. No, so it's very interesting. So we're part of a university that's part of a law school. We're a clinical law program in a law school and we represent clients. So, so there's this kind of crazy mix there. And you know, I do think, John, that the point reading the Rutgers cases, if you will, I mean, it's the Rutgers cases, but the thread about you know, the disadvantage of state public law schools vis-a-vis -vis private law schools, I think, is a very compelling argument um, to make. But, um, but I also want to back up a little bit and say that you know, as lawyers, we have the professional obligation to enhance access to justice, right? to provide legal services to individuals who otherwise would not have access to legal services, we also have the obligation not to um, deny representation because a particular matter is controversial or people don't like it. And that's inherent in everything that we do as lawyers. We as law professors have to model that for our students. That's our obligation. We have to model the ethical rules for our students. And so you are always going to have cases that people don't like. 
whether it's environmental law clinic, whether it's immigration law clinic, whether it's civil rights, whatever, what, you know, you, you could take your pick. And so that's just part of it is just in, is, 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 is in the fabric of, of, of you know, what, what we do. So that's, that's almost a given. We also, in our state programs, we represent clients. We have to meet them where they are. They are caught up in state systems. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to where they are. They are caught up in state systems, and we have to try to navigate them through the systems and hopefully get them out of those systems. So that's just sort of the backdrop. I think that um, perhaps we can do a better job of explaining all of those roles to our external stakeholders. Um, so that we have to create avenues of dialogue that are proactive and not reactive. We have to be offensive and not defensive. And so that's with the Board of Visitors, it's with our legislators, it's with the judiciary, it's with the bar, it's with legal services and other legal services providers, it's communities. We have to explain what we do, perhaps, a bit better. Um, we also, part of that is serving as a resource to the state. We all serve as resources to the state, right? State law schools, even private law schools, we all are resources, and sometimes we have to remind them of all the other great things that we do. This is, this is all the work that we do. You might like some of it, you might not like some of it, but you know, we all are coming from a very, very good place. And so, you know, look, when they call us and they want to ask us to testify on bills, we should testify on bills, right? They ask us to conduct research, we should conduct research, we should offer to do that. And we do do that, by the way. Um, otherwise, being available to provide advice is really important. Participating in judicial trainings is very, very important. Lee and I, we had a great time at the Maryland Judicial Institute last semester. I know Renee is about to have a great time next week. And various, various bar programs. We have to talk about and champion the full breadth of our programs. And again, this applies to private schools as well. But we have to talk about all the great work um, that we do, the ways in which our services benefit individuals, families, and communities. And we need to explain, we, and we explain that our, our role as lawyers is to provide access to justice, particularly in this environment of clinical, in a clinical law program. Our role is to educate students and enhance access to justice, to represent individuals who do not have access to attorneys otherwise, and also um, the obligation to take on matters that you know, might be controversial. Okay. So part of it is the legal aspect that John's talking about, but also the dialogue that's really, good. That's, um, that's really important. Thank you. We're trying to prevent, trying to not get to where John had to go, <laughs> honestly. I was just saying, right? and that could address that point about academic freedom, about explaining exactly. what we do in a way that... Uh, Exactly. Um, so, so Jane, I feel like I should have sat that way so I could That's okay. stop I, I having to fine. pivot. I, I don't mean to have my back to you it's for okay. much of this. Um, but I know that you've been researching. So, so Michael and John have been talking to us a bit about the ways in which clinical law programs um, might advance their missions. Uh, we heard a little bit about those sorts of cases that clinical law programs should be taking on. Um, I want you to get down to the nuts and bolts. So I know that you have been, you have been researching environmental law programs at law schools across the country. Um, you've been examining the types of systems that need to be put in place to take on those bigger cases. And can you talk to us a little bit about what you've learned? Okay. Um, this past summer and fall, uh, working in collaboration with Michelle Nolan, at, who runs the Environmental Law Clinic at Duke, and with Emily, one of our fellows here at the, the school, and one of Michelle's fellows, we surveyed all of the environmental law programs across the country who self-identified on their websites or who we could otherwise figure out had some type of environmental law clinic. Uh, we did that through a um, survey that was an electronic survey that went out, followed up with interviews to get the answers to questions for because we didn't get a lot of responses the first time around. And then we uh, split some of the schools up and did in-depth interviews with about 25 of the 66 schools that responded to the survey. Um, the results were that no <coughs> clinic, whether it's a private school or a public school, does it the same way. There is a wide range of substantive areas that are covered throughout the country 
you go from exclusively zoning to animal rights to um, to land and natural resources to some of the western schools who are near Bureau of Land Management uh, facilities to those of us who do a wide range of traditional environmental cases, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, uh, to those who focus exclusively on environmental justice. Um, the structure of the schools uh, is very different too. There are those most that are clinics within a school like we are. Mm -hmm. However, those that litigate um, contentious cases, you see more of a setup where the litigating arm is outside the clinic with a staffed by lawyers and then sometimes the lawyers are also faculty at the school, sometimes they're not, so there's a variation there. And then sometimes you have what people call clinics, um, and I guess Bob and I might agree that maybe they're not what we think as traditional clinics, where you're basically set up to your students go out and work for someone else on their cases. So, you know, but, but they call it a clinic. Okay. So I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what we found. Um, there's a range of credits, and the student learning really varies depending upon, obviously, where you are and how long your semester is. I think that the single most thing that is emphasized universally across all of the clinics is heavy emphasis on giving students the opportunity to research and do practical writing, drafting, you know, complaints, drafting memorandum to the court, you know, so that they have litigation-related writing. Now, keep in mind, 66 self-proclaimed environmental clinics. Mm -hmm. Of those 66, only 20-some, about a third, said they did litigation. And so when our follow-up discussions with some of them, <laughs> what? well, they do policy work. Okay. They do a lot okay. of policy work okay. out mm -hmm. there. Uh, and there is a lot of policy work out there to be done in the environmental field. Um, of the 20 some odd that said they do litigation, many of them do regulatory litigation, which mm -hmm. is commenting on permits, commenting on regulations, going to administrative hearings. Only about eight to 10 of us do federal court clean, uh, citizen suit litigation, which is complex civil litigation. And so you can see, because of resource issues, and I'm either shocked or sad or proud to say that we have the least resources of any of the schools that are doing uh, complex federal litigation of any of the schools we talk to. My takeaway is that you have to be properly staffed. And one of the lessons we learned from the Purdue case was it really does, it, you know, when you're in federal court, you have this whole system of external rules that once you hit discovery, comes on like a cascade. Mm -hmm. And to, in order to be professional about it and meet your professional responsibilities, you have to have a document management system, which thankfully, Andrew Keir here is a computer whiz and set ours up for us. You have to be able to handle discovery responsibilities. You have to be able to um, advise clients on their own discovery responsibilities. And so there's this whole cascade of uh, things that happen in federal court litigation, complex litigation, that you really need to be properly staffed for. Um, I'm envious of WashU. They've got a scientist on board, which in environmental cases, you got to have experts. We ran into the situation half, two thirds of the way of our class. We case we ran out of the money our clients had raised to pay for experts and we had to do supplemental experts reports so they had to go back out and find somebody else to raise money to pay the experts and that's not something that um, you know law firms run into it is something that I think clinics generally run into mm -hmm. so I, I, it it all comes back to I think the challenge for a university that is I think all schools have it but public mm -hmm. universities particularly have the staffing challenge. Mm -hmm. Because how do you find somebody who is a dedicated paralegal who has litigation skills? Mm -hmm. How do you find mm -hmm. you know, a staff attorney and pay a staff attorney who has seven to 10 years of actual litigation experience? That's a different skill set from a fellow that you are still training to take on the cases. Mm -hmm. So that's your big challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think it's reflected in the fact that not many clinics offer right. 
the complex litigation um, when you look at the 66 to about 10. Okay. So I have one more question for you, John, before I have a question for everybody. So I'm keying everybody up. Um, we've heard a lot of downside. <laughs> we've heard staffing issues. We've heard schizophrenic existence issues. We've heard <laughs> peculiar need for advanced <coughs> messaging issues. We've heard limited resource issues. We've heard puppet to a lot of different masters issues. Um, some folks might be thinking, why bother? <laughs> why bother? Why bother doing this at a state-run school? Um, are there any unique upsides? to running a clinical program at a state-run university? Well, I start by saying a lot of the downsides you point to are not unique to state mm -hmm. law schools and state universities. Uh, there are probably only a small category of those. And, um, the, the outside political influence and the ability to affect our funding in ways mm -hmm. and construe us as the state and the like. But I definitely think, I think to sort of play on some of the things Michael has been talking about, the collaborations that state and public law schools and universities tend to naturally have with state government and state legislatures and state uh, agencies and the like, uh, gives us uh, a lot of opportunities. And I think public law schools often express and should express a greater recognized obligation for public service. We're public after all. You should have public missions. Um, and some of the upsides that, that also come with being in a public institution with a public mission is I think there's greater general support from the university for the work that's viewed as public service within the institution. Um, and since there's that heightened recognition of a public service and a public mission, that you hope pervades the whole university, that gives us you know, the opportunity for, I think, greater interdisciplinary possibilities and partners for collaboration within a university um, for the benefit of our clients and uh, for a greater service learning and this interdisciplinary learning possibilities for our students. I think another aspect, being a, a you know, public institution that's supposed to serve the public, uh, we ought to be more representative of the public. We ought to be more diverse in who it is we're taking and who our teachers are and who we're trying to serve. And um, I think a lot of public institutions try to do that. I mean, some private institutions do as well, but I think public institutions should have a particular, um, it should be particularly on the radar of public institutions with a public mission. And uh, with the benefits of diversity, I think also aided with lower subsidized state tuition can help us be a little bit more economically diverse. Um, and I'm thinking of this, you know, outside of states which have explicitly tried to undermine diversity. California, you know, I'm talking <laughs> about you. Uh, we have the benefits of diversity, uh, both the pedagogical benefits and the service benefits to offer from the advantage of being in a public institution with a public mission that recognizes the importance of a, a more representative uh, student body and faculty and personnel. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask all of you one question before I'm turning it over to you guys or opening it up to you guys for questions. And so my last question is, we've been talking a lot about the present and I'd like you each to gaze into the crystal ball and think a little bit about the future. And so if you had to think, looking forward five, 10 years, what is the greatest <coughs> opportunity or obstacle, you can be positive or negative, that you see s clinical law programs at state-run universities facing? And Jane, I'll start with you and we'll run that way. Well, I want to be positive. Um, I think it's creativity. Um, I think that state universities, and it's building on what John said, is we have a opportunity to marshal the resources of the university system. We're seeing it here with the Empower Outreach, but it also is, in my particular field, it's, um, we need diverse 
interdisciplinary support for our cases and exposure of our students. I also think there's the creativity to think about ways that clinical education can build and incorporate some of the substantive law that we teach. And I'll just give you an example that I've talked to somebody about. Um, in my clinic, you cannot go through a year like we did last year without learning civil procedure A to Z. I mean, you just can't. Um, and so looking at ways, and the challenge for the students is that when you're in litigation and you've only got a four credit course, how do I also take civil procedure or also take some of my substantive classes? So I would challenge us to be creative about ways that we can enhance the opportunity for the student to be in the clinic with more credit hours by marrying that with a relevant substantive law skill and kind of team teaching. And I can think administrative law, mm -hmm. evidence, civil procedure, ethics. I mean, it's kind of groundless. So that's my opportunity. OK, that's fair enough. John. It's hard for me to get beyond the present to get too far <laughs> into the future. And I think both our biggest present and probably at least short term, I hope short term, future challenge, which I'd like to think is also a, a future and present opportunity, is reacting to the changing legal market mm -hmm. and legal economy, which is on everybody's minds now in some way. And the issue is it's not limited to state clinics by any means, but it does have a state law school twist in that, you know, how do we respond to declining student enrollments as even generally lower state tuition public institutions have declining enrollments uh, relative to uh, tuition is rising relative to the increasing student debt loads. Um, and we're also seeing decreasing support from the states for what it is we're doing in terms of what we're getting in subsidies. So what will public institutions do in response in light of all these factors in our present market and economy and the dynamics with the states? And how will that affect uh, clinical legal education programs. On the potential downside, will law school clinical programs be diminished as we are being, uh, you know, sucked of, of resources in this manner? Um, on the upside, I mean, the ABA and legal education generally is moving towards demanding that schools do more to uh, prepare our debt-ridden students for the ethical and competent practice of law. But will valuable but more costly in-house clinical programs, which have been the cornerstone of many public institutions, like right here at Maryland and, and my school and, and Rutgers and many others, will they be reduced or replaced with less extens expensive external placements uh, or simulation courses? I see that as a major challenge um, that uh, we will have to confront. But I also see this issue as a great opportunity, as I think the changing marketplace also making students to bar and the bench, the consuming public, uh, demand more from law schools and preparing students for the bar more than ever before. I believe nothing does this better than clinical education. I think the focus also on the market and the oversaturation of lawyers in certain segments of the market, we're talking about big law, mm -hmm. and the bursting of, of uh, the law market bubble, um, provides an opportunity to focus on aspects of the market that are not being served as well and adequately uh, and provides the opportunity for law schools through their clinical programs and otherwise to, again, as Jane points out, think creatively, design programs uh, to assist and prepare our students to meet unmet legal demands in the private market that are unmet and start look at ways to leverage the school's resources and the skills and initiatives of clinical faculty to create training and support for law students to transition from being law students to becoming, uh, you know, vital and sustaining community-based practitioners serving this unmet need. And again, Maryland has been a pioneer with Mike's work and Brenda's work and launching the Community Legal Resource Network concept and phenomena many years ago. We see that taking off now, exploding around the country. Why is it exploding now? Because of the economy now it's exploding and it's a great upside and clinicians are at the forefront of this. We have a graduate in-house firm now that is self-sustaining, providing low bono representation to persons with moderate income to try to promote a transition from uh, 
students uh, to viable small and solo community-based practitioners in underserved areas. And I suspect we're going to see a lot more creative thinking around uh, this way, th this line of thinking that will be led by clinical faculty and clinical programs. In fact, I think maybe it was last week there was a conference at Toro, perhaps, on incubators mm -hmm. that uh, had, was really well attended from... Oh, it's today, okay. Same time. We should be there. <laughs> they should be here. They should be here. They yeah. should be here. <laughs> that's right. They should be here. But that, that's, I see again that the market is both challenge and opportunity. Okay. Michael. I agree with everything John just said. I have nothing to add to that. But I, I actually want to take a step back to something John just said previous to that comment. And you talked about the Edgar Kahn Award for the best, one right. of the top 20 articles in the 20th century. But John wrote the article, um, Faculty Diversity as a Clinical Legal Education Imperative, back in 2001, I believe it was. I th and so he, John talked about the lack of racial diversity mm -hmm. among folks who teach in clinical law programs. And so I agree with all the, ch the challenges and opportunities moving forward, but I do think that diversity is one of our biggest challenges moving forward. That's at state law school, that's at private law schools. Uh, particularly because, you know, with, with the budgets the way that they are right now, we are not, we're not positioned to, to hire, at least in the immediate short term. And that's the other issue going forward, I think, is, and folks have talked about this a lot, though, is that when we talk about the future of clinical legal education, we actually do have to think about the folks who would be teaching the future of clinical legal education and what kind of backgrounds and experiences do we believe individuals should have moving forward? And we have um, a lot of discussions in various law schools about what those skill sets should be. Mm -hmm. So that's always a ch I agree with everything that's been said, but I just wanted to throw that on the table as well as a, as a future challenge for all of us. So just to follow up on that, and then I am, I swear, going to turn it over to you guys, I swear. Um, but just to follow up on that, so it, to move into podium teaching, Right? We see lots of fellowships like the Clemenco and other fellowships like that that allow people to move into podium teaching. It's <coughs> perhaps an obligation of clinical law programs to create those same sorts well. of fellowships that would allow people to I'm looking. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at Deborah Epstein because Georgetown they do a has great job of it. an incredibly yeah. awesome yeah. Mm -hmm. they do clinical a fellows job of it. program, which <laughs> No, 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 no. But my point is that's, that's the sort of, that's the Cadillac, if you will, right. of, of a faculty that's been committed to you know, training the next generation. And they've been doing it um, for decades as well. So I just, you said that, well, you know. But my point is that's an example that we should all be looking at and aspire to in some ways. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Um, I've got Michael and then Praveen and then Jose. Yes. A couple of real quick things. First of all, as someone who had a role in playing in the environmental law program, I'm really proud of being a review appointment. I'm really proud of every day. Mm -hmm. And you have a very strong argument to keep doing it. Okay? I want to come back and talk about preemptive steps. How you can do it and not get hammered. Mm -hmm. Okay? A little more background, I think you have a much stronger argument to keep doing it than you do to sue the state of Massachusetts. Okay? For 10 years, mm -hmm. between 1975 and 85, I filed five lawsuits against the state, including this lawsuit, mm -hmm. three class actions, one of all, one damage action for a prisoner, one, and the famous Frederick County case. Frederick County case, the county issued a, a parade permit to the KKK that said white Gentiles only. <laughs> so we sued, <laughs> NACB came to us and said, yes, we sued. We sued, we won, we should not. We should have taken it through, we realized we get the end of the, the end of the rainbow, we shouldn't have won. Because the, the remedy is to integrate the KKK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we sued um, 
Hey, Juno, in that case, the evening shift guards, this is relevant to my point about, about what you need mm -hmm. to be preempted. The evening shift guards are taking kids out of their cells, stripping them naked, hanging them by their wrist, and mixing them. And we knew that because we had six or seven clients who had the same scar in their hand. We closed down the juvenile institution where the male guards were raping the teenage girls. We won a suit against a, the mental institutions because they weren't giving access to lawyers to represent clients. It, it, it goes on and on. My point is we had the moral high ground in this case. We had the moral high ground. And you have to have the moral high ground in your case. Um, from the point of view of attorney's fees, I'll tell you why I stopped doing them in a second. From the point of view of attorney's fees, I was in the attorney general's office, the street size of the attorney general. My job was really an internal civil rights uh, compliance job. I, I'd go around to the agency and try to stop them from doing stuff that I knew legal aid was going to sue them. And they would say to me, well, let them sue them. And if they win, we'll stop. <laughs> and the only answer I had is, yeah. So the ability to ask for attorney's fees is the only thing you've got sometimes in litigation against the state. If, you know, unless you've got good people on your side, so they're not going to stop you from telling them to do something illegal. They're going to stop because they're paying out $100,000 for attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's important. Okay, so why did I stop? I stopped because uh, we created the Public Justice Center. And the Public Justice Center now does the litigation we were doing in the house. That's not a good enough reason by itself. But, and um, I think it's possible to work out an internship relationship with the private organization so that they can get the benefits of class action litigation and not, and not have law school directly you know, in the line of fire. You don't have that in the environmental. You don't have another environmental litigation on mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I think that all the more reasons you need to, keep, you need to be aggressive. I stopped because, although I think that the argument for doing it is completely principled, if we were a self-contained law school, if the clinic was a self-contained law school, and therefore we got hammered, we got hammered, we could fight back, then I'm saying keep doing it. But it imperils the rest of the enterprise. And Pragmatically, it means you're in a state of constant siege. And I thought that there were different ways to do it. Now, maybe the answer is I stopped with that tire. <laughs> I mean, I that. There were several governors who were coming after all parts of the law school. Uh, so, but it's a pragmatic reason. I mean, I, there's something that I found disconcerting about me making up all these good arguments. I mean, making them up. I mean, listing all and then imperiling the rest of the institution. Mm -hmm. So is, is that a principal reason? No. But um, I offer it as, as something worth it. Did any of you want to comment on that before I take the next question? <laughs> OK. Proving. Yes. Uh, so my question is for, for all of you, but directed at, at Jane, and, and, and it goes back to sort of the resources. Right. And so you're just, Describing being resource constrained and, and engaging in, in very, very high profile stuff that's going to garner attention where the other side is very powerful. And one, the question is are public law schools constrained or impeded differently than private law schools in soliciting uh, partnerships and/or help from the private bar? Uh, and think about some Supreme Court claims, right? So they're engaged in high profile stuff. Right. And, and at least all of the Supreme Court firms that I know of also always partner with a, with a big firm to, to do that kind of work. Is that something you could do, or is there something unique about public, public uh, universities and institutions that it is There is not something unique about public universities. There's something unique about environmental law. Uh, <laughs> because what happens is we have attempted to partner with law firms in uh, business conflicts typically are what impede our ability to partner. So in, in other words, you have a, uh, you're working on appealing regulations that affect 
uh, con the construction industry, well, any law firm that has clients who build are basically uh, prohibited from joining you. Um, the ag industry, when we were doing this, we had a number of partners and law firms come to us and say, well, we'd like to co-counsel with you. Then they'd run it through their conflicts, and then they'd be told they couldn't. So, I mean, that is the, that's more of a unique environmental. I, the one impediment, I think, that there is a difference when you're talking about trial court litigation as opposed to appellate litigation is many law firms, and I used to sit on the pro bono committee at my law firm, it is an intense amount of time that you have got to convince your partners to let you do. And oftentimes it's not discreet. Um, you can do uh, an appellate brief and you know the constraints of what you're working for and you can pitch that. When you're talking trial, it's a lot harder to, to sell your law firm that it should be that many hours devoted to this case. So there are two con there's one constraint that's unique to the substance of law area. There's another that I think complex litigation, it's harder to get major law firms willing to give as much time as needed to do those trial cases, as opposed to appellate work. I think appellate work you can clearly get help on. Just one follow up to that. Um, if your litigation is geographically uh, centered, uh, could, you, could you reach sort of beyond the borders of this region for uh, partnerships with the firm? So for example, you know, get a Chicago firm to potentially partner uh, with the as long as they're not a national firm, because you, know, you, you may still have national conflict. And actually, um, there was one case that we did not take on because we just didn't have the resources where the partner firm actually was a small California firm that did, that, in, that ended up partnering with the client in another um, nonprofit, it was a small California firm that did water law. So, I mean, that's possible. Um, but what you find is that those firms are being pulled in by, you know, lots of other interests. But Jose, I had you next, and then Bob. Hi. Um, I just want to just make a comment about the role of private funds in assisting the clinic to do some of the work that they're doing, and and how important that will be. I mean, how important. Thank you, Bob. So I was struck uh, this morning the first panel there was a discussion about uh, who's the client mm -hmm. in the community-based representation. And it really struck me that at a state school, the issue of who is the client, but more importantly, to make sure you have a client is really right. With all due respect, all the research I've done, academic freedom, just that, that, that dog in my bar. <laughs> Thank you. 
coalitions of treatment programs that we represent, that we work closely with, and who we have represented in other litigation. We could take those individuals on as clients. Um, did I think in that, in, this, in the posture in which we were, that we needed that in order to protect ourselves and protect the integrity of our work? I made the decision that we didn't need that event at, at this particular juncture. Um, and I guess, you know, I, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of advocacy, obviously, around this set of issues. Um, uh, often, interestingly, in collaboration with the state in order to get this right. So during the development of the state's legislation related to the implementation of the ACA, we work very closely in collaboration with a large coalition um, in which the governor's office of health care reform adopted our, you know, adopted our recommendations in order to put those standards in place. At the same time, we, we have run up against other arms of the state government that haven't been as cooperative or as willing. Um, and we then try to use those other internal arms and strategies to, to leverage those other agencies to come off along. So um, I fully appreciate and understand that point of view. And you put out the figure. Yeah, you know, and again, it may be often, and again, this is an interesting situation. I mean, I practiced for many, many years before coming to teach. And I worked for a public interest law firm in which we did a lot of this issue advocacy. And so that's my background and training, and it's my weakness probably. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, coming to a, an institution, an academic institution, where there are other resources. You've got to make friends with a very sick person who knows whether <laughs> but, but, that, but, that, but that also goes back, I think, to being a state school to a certain extent. Because sometimes we heard about this earlier today as well, that, for instance, legislative advocacy could come out of client work. When a coalition contacts you because of your contacts in the community, sometimes we are the only lawyers on a bill. It could be a policy group, doesn't have a legal background, so you are the expert on the law. That's one instance. Another instance is, we often get calls from legislatures to say, there is this bill, can you come testify on it? That's no, it is different, but I'm just saying this, there's a range of, there's, there's all these different relationships that, um, yeah. Well, I, mean, I don't think it stops us from doing our work. Right, right. It right. keeps me it's just covering our rear. Oh, no, absolutely. I hear you. Right. right, no, no, right. no doubt. Deborah, I had you. questions. If not, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative. So I actually have a question for the panel, but for you too. Um, and so one of the things that we've heard a lot about in terms of state-run clinical law programs is the social justice mission and impressing upon students access to justice and impressing upon students the need to serve underserved communities. And then they get a very different message from things like the refusal of the Senate to confirm Debo Adegbele. What do we say about that? What do we say as clinicians about that, about 
we're telling our students access to justice and social justice mission as if it's a no-cost enterprise, and they are getting very real-world messages that it's a high-cost enterprise. Do we have an obligation to say something to them about the downsides of doing this work? So, do you guys too? Oh, okay. Don't 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 get me started talking about. I did. I, I just found I mean. that his the refusal of the Senate to confirm him I found so deeply frustrating and so deeply yes. antithetical to everything we teach our students about the importance of access to justice. I, I think, and I'm I'm only going to I can't That's speak for Lonnie everybody, Lanier. but I, but I do think that. You know, when, when you're representing clients who have been marginalized in a variety of ways, that I would hope that our students, that students get it at some point, that it's not the most popular thing to do, right? I'm just, I would hope that they get that. And we as lawyers, again, have to model the ethical rules that say we have this obligation to enhance access to justice. We have this obligation to represent people who would otherwise not be represented for a variety of reasons, including poverty and other forms of marginalization. Mm -hmm. That's our obligation as lawyers. And now, obviously, there will be times when people get upset. And you know, honestly, everything that John has been through, everything that, mm -hmm. that we have been through as a law school, are all teaching moments <coughs> for the students who have been through that. They get the harsh lessons that there will be people who do not like what they do. Our job is to make them stronger for it and not weaker for it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. When I, when I, when I think about what happened to Debo, mm -hmm. I would hope that that would outrage our students to such an extent that they wouldn't shy away from doing that work. It would make them run towards that work. But, you know. Okay. That's exactly yes. what I was going to say. I do. I don't think you would either. Right? And so yeah. given that, I don't think that we do have an obligation, at least not at that point when a student is in a place where they can necessarily hear it mm -hmm. or have any way to contextualize it. Okay. Praveen and then in the back. Yes. So I think, I mean, to me, this gets back to the conversation this morning about being explicit about mm. the underlying social mission right. uh, of a clinic. And, and so I can imagine a situation where if you're not explicit, right, if it's just a civil litigation clinic, uh, and, 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 and all students, right, regardless of their political leanings, uh, want to get civil litigation experience, and so they enroll in the clinic, and then they get an assignment, right, again, not, not by choice, not by uh, opting in, uh, but by assignment to, to defend Mumia. Let's say uh -huh. that, that was a clinic project, right, um, 20 years ago, or whatever long ago it was, and Let's say it was a conservative student 
right, that ended up uh, mm -hmm. engaged in that representation, right? Because this, this thing yeah. is all political, right? right? But, but again, if, you, if you don't, you're if you not explicit, number one, you might get that student. Number two, they might get that representation. And then what's the conversation we're having today right. about this issue, right? That That's one of the reasons maybe to not be explicit uh, about sort of, you know, any social mission that might yeah. undergird uh, a clinic. Um, I'm sure there's an argument on the other side of that, but I'm just throw that out. All the way in the back, and then Brenda, and then over here. Yes. That's exactly what I was thinking this morning when you were talking about setting up your own initial statement and whether you should disclose it or not. I thought it seemed to me that the whole problem, the goal of a clinical program would be to bridge students' practical um, lawyering after, after they graduate, whether they're Brenda. brings us back to the point that you made earlier about messaging, right, and preemptive yeah. messaging and getting out, and the language, the discussion at lunch about the language and capturing that language and, and owning it so that we control the conversation. Any other questions? If not, I'd like to thank our panel.